this I'll this one, I'll read this one, okay. I'll need two. Yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, well, good morning, everybody. I'm Malcolm Chalmers. I'm the, the Deputy Director at the Royal United Services Institute. And it, it's my pleasure to be chairing uh, this uh, first session uh, of, of this event on learning from aid spending uh, in Afghanistan for other fragile and conflict affected states. Uh, I uh, myself have uh, had some experience in Afghanistan, mainly uh, during the period right at the beginning of the British intervention uh, in Helmand province, uh, way back in 2006. And many people here uh, have had experience over that period. It's fair to say that there was a period uh, during which uh, for the UK as for the US, uh, this was the primary focus uh, of our foreign policy and certainly defence policy effort uh, for, for quite some time. Uh, and one of the one of the characteristics of uh, of modern societies, for good or for ill, is that sometimes when we move on, we really move on, <laughs> and we don't learn uh, lessons from our past experiences, especially if they haven't gone as well as we hope for. Uh, but it's also the case that uh, we always say, and I, I really believe, that one of the strengths of democracies uh, is not that they don't make mistakes, but because they certainly do, uh, but they're better able than our rivals to learn from those mistakes. But that's something we have to prove in practice, not just in theory. And that's one of the purposes of the session uh, today, to see what we can learn from the experience of Afghanistan, because we will continue to have situations in which uh, our countries uh, want to... Uh, I, I, there seems to be some problem with the microphone, but uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, we, we want to... Uh, intervene, we want to assist in reconstruction, deconstruction countries affected by conflict. And there's an awful lot of experience from Afghanistan that we can draw on in that regard. To help get us started, uh, we've got the heads of the, the two organizations, which are constitutionally in our respective uh, countries, given the responsibility for independent oversight uh, of uh, reconstruction. And in the case of uh, our colleague, uh, John Sopko from uh, CIGAR, specifically, he's a Special Inspector General uh, for Afghanistan Reconstruction and has been uh, in that position uh, for just over 10 years, uh, very 11 years now, uh, and before that, more than 30 years of experience in oversight and investigations as a prosecutor, congressional counsel, and senior uh, government advisor. Uh, so John, John will, will, will speak first, but very much focus on Afghanistan. And I, uh, I think many of you will have experienced during the long period of British involvement uh, in Helmand province in particular, we were subject to what, what I could only describe as happy talk. So every time a commander came back from, from Helmand, we were told how well things were going, particularly on the tour of that particular uh, brigadier uh, and uh, things were only getting better and you heard this time and time again and it was quite a surprise when after several years things seemed to be getting worse but it was always a great um, uh, sobering experience to read cigar reports uh, and uh, as, a, as a dose of realism I think what's, what's actually happening on the ground in Afghanistan so John very welcome uh, to you and then secondly we're going to be uh, Sir Hugh Bailey, who's uh, the ICAI commissioner, uh, uh, who um, presented ICAI's independent commission on aid impact, so Afghanistan findings to Parliament, who's a former parliamentarian and indeed the MP for York uh, for 23 years. So Hugh, very much uh, welcome to you. He's a former president also the NATO Parliamentary Assembly, so well-versed in defence and security issues. So they will speak respectively on Afghanistan, uh, the experience from that, but also I think reflecting on some of the broader lessons we can draw from that so we can do things uh, even better uh, 
uh, next time. So, John, uh, if you could use the lectern and, and introduce us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction. And um, I want to thank uh, Rusi and Aikai for uh, hosting this event. I think it's a, a very useful event. Apropos of lessons learned, uh, we have the President of the United States meeting with your Prime Minister on Ukraine. And some people have said there are lessons learned that could be applied to Ukraine, and that's something we can discuss later. Um, there's a lot of similarities, but a lot of differences between those two countries. Uh, just briefly, uh, I was appointed by uh, President Obama and then serve uh, under the uh, Trump and Biden administration as the SIGAR, Special IG for Afghanistan Reconstruction. A little bit about my agency, it was created, it's a special IG, it was created to look at all of the money, it was a fantastic amount of money being spent in Afghanistan at that time. They wanted one independent IG to be able to look at the whole of government, the all of the money spent by the United States on reconstruction. And we are special in that way because we are a whole of government organization. We can only look at Afghanistan, but we can look at all of the money spent or appropriated by the US government, no matter where it's spent. So we can follow the money into the UN, World Bank and elsewhere. So that was a different approach. Um, we were truly independent because as I used to joke, we reported to one person and one person only in the US government and he never wanted to see me. So we reported to the president. So it was a true independence uh, to speak about that. Um, we also are unique in a way because we are the only inspectors general office of the 70 some independent inspectors general in the United States who has created its own lessons learned program where I have dedicated staff who focus on trying to draw some lessons from this 20 year experience, which is something most of our IGs don't do. They don't have that jurisdiction because they don't have the whole of government authority on that. And you'll be hearing from one of my best lessons learned analysts and senior analysts who has uh, produced some of the best reports I can say on the subject. We have uh, summarized those lessons learned in a handout, which I think many of you have, and it's available, and all of our reports are available online. We probably are the largest repository of information on Afghanistan in the United States government. We've interviewed over 800 people for these reports. We've issued 12 reports on various topics, which were recommended by some of our allies, including the UK, and many of our generals and ambassadors. So I think they're worthwhile for anybody who wants to study that 20 year long war. Uh, we've been asked as a result of it to actually brief a number of governments outside of the United States, including the German parliament, including some of the Nordic countries, as well as the UK. We've also been asked by a number of prominent senators to combine our research into focusing on lessons learned that can be applied to future endeavors. And many people say that, uh, I know many of you don't want to ever hear the word Afghanistan, but that was sort of what we, uh, we heard after Vietnam that we were never going to do it again. Well, I would say we have done it again, and we may be doing it again uh, right now around the world. So I think as somebody is, uh, uh, has referred to, if you, you know, if you don't learn your lessons, you're doomed to repeat the mistakes. And I think that's something that's worthwhile all of us to uh, study. Um, I think if I can quickly in the few minutes I have, and happy to talk in more detail over questions, focus on some of the major lessons that I think should be kept in mind. These are observations that based upon our work that we should keep in mind as we approach other 
areas where we're trying to construct or reconstruct a country in the middle of a war. And one is you have to deal with corruption. I think perhaps that was the greatest challenge in Afghanistan, and it undermined our entire mission there. Not only did we lose a lot of money, not only did a lot of money and goods and services be uh, uh, were, were taken by the Taliban and other insurgencies, but it also lost the morale of the Afghan people, the Afghan government, and turned many of the Afghan people away from the coalition and what we were trying to do. What's more importantly, and this is the other lesson, is that we actually contributed to the corruption problem because we sent so much money so quickly and so poor a country with so little oversight that we actually were giving more money than a gross domestic product of, uh, of Afghanistan for a number of years. And for those of you who are students of uh, uh, development aid, you know there's an absorptive rate. How much can a country absorb before the money is wasted? And it's usually 15 to 30 percent. As I said, we were we, the United States alone, were giving more than over 100 percent of the GDP. So that is a problem to keep in mind. How much can the host government, host country absorb? The other thing, along with the massive amount of money, is we imposed unrealistic timelines for success. We did not focus on the reality on the ground. We focused on what were timelines set by politicians in Washington, Brussels, you name the country, but that is what drove the train and to show successes so that met, it met the timelines of politicians back home, that was a problem because that didn't reflect the reality on the ground. And one way to show success in a short term time uh, is to make success related to the amount of money you spend. So in essence, we spent more money to try to show successes to meet short deadlines, which just contributed to the problem. Another important issue to keep in mind is the problem of lack of coordination. We had 50 some countries and international organizations operating in Afghanistan. And it was very difficult to coordinate between the United States and those other countries and vice versa. But equally, we had problems with 20 or 30 different US government agencies operating in Afghanistan. And that was a serious problem. We were working at cross purposes many times. So it's something to keep in mind when you have massive whole of governments involvement in a country to coordinate that. And the coordination is not only for governments, it's also coordinating oversight. We had many instances where each government has their own oversight authority. Each government has their own Supreme Audit Agency. Each government had their own investigative authorities. And none of us were sharing that information. There's a very funny story that I'll quickly say has to do with the European Oversight Agency, whose acronym is OLAF, O-L-A-F. I don't know what it means in French, but that's the acronym. And I remember being told by an EU ambassador saying, you need to talk to OLAF. And I said, who's OLAF? And I, of course, didn't say that to him directly. After I got done briefing by him, I asked my staff, because nobody in Washington wants to admit they don't know anything. So uh, and they told me Olaf is his agency. So we went to Brussels. We talked to him, and they had this fantastic report highlighting a problem with the UN and the way it monitored the millions of dollars we were giving to the Afghans for police salaries and training. It turns out we were paying for ghosts. So I remember leaving Brussels and going to Kabul and sitting down with our embassy staff and, our, and with our generals at uh, ISAF who controlled the funding. And I said, have you talked to Olaf? And they, of course, said, who's Olaf? Obviously, they didn't know. And this is just an example of many times we didn't know what the other allies were doing on oversight. We didn't know what their blacklist of contractors were or their whitelist. And likewise, they didn't know what we had. And that was a serious problem. The other problem is monitoring and evaluation. Now, what is that? Well, basically, it's understanding 
whether your money is doing what it's supposed to do. We had horrible M&E or monitoring evaluation programs in uh, Afghanistan. By we, I mean the United States. I don't, can't speak for the other uh, donor nations. And the problem there was, again, with these fast, these, these short timelines and the desire to show success, we didn't really want honest assessments of what was going on. So what we would focus on, monitoring evaluation is, as we used to say, uh, it's how to do the wrong thing perfectly. You checked boxes. And that's what we did in Afghanistan. We focused on inputs, how much money we're spending, outputs, what you bought for that, how many shoes, how many hospitals. But we never looked at the hardest thing for m and &E, and that is what was the outcome. So if you spent $100 million to build clinics and you had X number of clinics, you could check the box. We spent the 100 million, we built 100 clinics. The question is, were they being used? And likewise, you could apply that to everything, including buying weapons, including buying uh, for schools, et cetera. You bought it, but you didn't really know how it was being spent. So that is an in a very important problem that you have to deal with. The other problem I think you have to focus is particularly in an environment. And again, we're talking about an environment in Afghanistan and around the world where we're doing this, where it's not secure. So most donors, including the United States, are very protective of their staff. So instead of sending aid employees out there in the countryside, uh, Washington doesn't want those people to get hurt, like most host governments don't. So you bring in third party monitoring. You bring in or you use multilateral or international organizations. Now that's good, but the problem is we have had a history of problems with getting information from the UN, the World Bank, Asian Development Bank, you name the international organization. They don't share information well with donors. I can only speak for the United States, but I've also heard from other ambassadors that they are not knowing, they don't know what and how uh, these international organizations spend money. So that's another issue to deal with when you're dealing with multilateral organizations. They're good, they can do good work, but they have a tendency of not sharing their oversight, internal oversight mechanisms, their m and &E, with donors. So if you're gonna give the money to them, you should know how the money's being spent. One last issue I wanna mention, it wasn't as big a problem in the, in the US dealing with Afghanistan, but this has to do with the private sector. We really never did develop the private sector that much. I throw this out because you just had a meeting here on Ukraine last June, I think just a, just a few weeks ago, in which there was a lot of discussion about uh, business, uh, private sector development in a place like Ukraine. I'm not opposed to that. I think it's a great idea. Let them spend some of the money, but they have different timelines. They have different objectives. They have different transparency than government agencies or international organizations. So again, I just throw that out for consideration if you're looking at <laughs> lessons learned from Afghanistan that could be applicable to the Ukraine, Mali, or any other country where there is whole of government and whole of government's work on reconstructing. Thank you. John, thank you so much for getting us off to a great start, really rich presentation. I had about a dozen questions related to it, but I will hold back uh, and ask uh, Sir Hugh to, to take the, the, uh, the podium, please. Well, thank you, Malcolm. Look, uh, let me begin by thanking Rusi for hosting this event, uh, Sigar for um, coming across the Atlantic to share their findings with us in the UK and uh, you all for coming to attend, and you online. Um, hundred or so people are joining uh, online as well. Um, both my organization, ICA and CIGAR, have um, broadly similar mandates. We have uh, an official responsibility to act as a watchdog um, at arm's length 
from our respective governments. Our independence is guaranteed by the fact that we report not to our sponsoring department, the FCDO, but to uh, jointly to the Foreign Secretary and the um, Commons International uh, Development Committee. Like ICAI, our mandate allows us to look across aid spending by all government departments uh, and agencies. But unlike CIGAR, we focus on UK aid uh, across the piece, not just in Afghanistan. We have, however, in recent months, uh, published two reports uh, on UK aid spending in Afghanistan. In uh, November last year, we published uh, a review of aid spending in the seven years leading up to our withdrawal in 2021, um, which reached con conclusions and true lessons, which I'll talk about. Uh, and then in May, we published an information note, um, simply putting in the public domain an explanation of how the uh, £286 million pounds a year for the first two years following withdrawal of UK aid uh, for humanitarian purposes in Afghanistan uh, has been spent. That, of course, made Afghanistan the UK's biggest uh, humanitarian program by quite some margin. Uh, when we conducted our reviews, we learned a great deal from Sigar's work, and we thank you. We had uh, we both read your um, documents, but also had the benefit of uh, interviews with six uh, of your officials. But we also, of course, reviewed uh, UK government um, documents, over 5,000 uh, UK government documents, the vast majority of which are documents which weren't uh, and aren't in the public domain. We interviewed um, 70 other stakeholders, um, many of them senior um, ambassadors and other senior UK government officials, um, and held six focus groups to talk with Afghan citizens in the diaspora. We normally try to go in country when we're conducting our studies, but we were unfortunately unable to do field work in the country in Afghanistan on this occasion. Um, we conclude, concur with um, all of Sigar's key lessons to learn, but we have some things to add from a, a UK perspective, um, especially about the coherence between US objectives and those of uh, the United States principal allies. In doing our studies, we obviously started by looking uh, at UK strategy. What was it that the UK was trying to achieve uh, in Afghanistan? Uh, over the 20-year period, the UK dispersed um, some 3.5 billion UK pounds, uh, at today's exchange rate, 4.5 billion US dollars, perhaps given historical exchange rates, uh, maybe a bit more than that. Um, and this money was used in support of the UK's overarching strategic objectives. It was a UK aid um, uh, uh, plank uh, of an overall UK strategy for the country. Um, so what were our objectives? Um, principally for the UK to support our closest and most important ally, United States, which had uh, lost almost uh, 3,000 people killed in the 9-11 attacks, uh, but also to protect people in the UK and elsewhere from future terrorist attacks. This aid spend over 20 years uh, achieved some important results, expanding education, for example, including to 2.8 million Afghan girls who now are basic literacy, in some cases a lot more than basic literacy, and are still part of the population of a country. Uh, reducing maternal and child deaths, um, improving irrigation, uh, helping millions of people through humanitarian aid through successive droughts. Um, but UK uh, aid and the aid from the international community failed in achieving its principal objective, which was to build a viable state, Afghan state, which uh, enjoyed support from its citizens. So why did we fail? Well, we agree with um, Sigar. Uh, on strategy, uh, there was mission creep, 
what started off as a mission to uh, remove a threat that Al Qaeda uh, posed to people um, became a much more complicated uh, mission over time, uh, including um, removing the threat from the Taliban uh, and uh, building a whole series of other development and state building uh, objectives. Um, our findings uh, identified a lack of coherence between uh, coalition allies uh, on the approach uh, which should be taken, um, principally, of course, between the United States and other allies, since this was a US-led mission, because they put in by far the majority of the money uh, and the troops on the ground. Um, Senior UK officials, ambassadors, told us that they didn't have the influence at a strategic level that they sought. Uh, one ambassador told us that we tolerated that because this, and I quote, uh, was not the Third World War, because the UK didn't face an existential threat to Western democracy, to uh, our independence and freedom. The implication being that if we did face such a threat, the relationship between allies would have to work in a more um, collegiate style. We agree very much with Cigar that um, the timelines were unrealistically short about the length of time that reconstruction would take. Uh, on sustainability, we absolutely agree. There were too many short-term projects and that aid often lost sight of the bigger picture. On personnel, we think there was a problem with the rapid turnover of UK expatriate staff. Um, we found that this increased the focus on short-term projects rather than longer-term reconstruction and contributed to poor institutional memory. Uh, I visited Afghanistan as a parliamentarian uh, seven times, I think, between 2001 and uh, 2015 when I left the parliament. And <laughs> I would have knowledge that our people on the ground didn't have. I had been through three iterations of how to um, stop poppy cultivation in uh, Helmand uh, uh, to replace it with growing saffron, to replace, replace it subsequently by growing mint, to replace it subsequently by growing wheat. And people on the ground didn't seem to be aware that there'd been future uh, approaches um, from which they ought to learn. We also took the view that the UK gave insufficient attention to its locally recruited staff who spoke the language, who like languages, I should say, who understood the uh, culture, who were free to mix and mingle in the community for a lot longer than expatriate staff were able to do so, and who crucially were there for a, a long period of time, five years, 10 years in some cases, and did have much better um, uh, 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 memories of what had been worked and tried. On security, both we and Cigar understand that the absence of violence was a critical precondition for development work to uh, uh, to, to to happen. Um, and from the UK, we were told that from the mid noughties onwards the UK was advocating uh, work to broaden the base of the uh, government of Afghanistan, um, which uh, we saw as too centralized with a uh, president uh, from one particular uh, ethnic group in a multi-ethnic country, albeit a larger single uh, group, um, Pashtun group, uh, but the UK also felt there should be attempts to pull in people who were supportive of the Taliban, uh, but who yet were tractable and were prepared to um, build a future. And we regret 
they, or they will regret it, our informants regretted the fact that uh, such steps were not taken when the UK was in a position uh, of strength. Um, one of our recommendations in our November report um, said this, that in complex stabilization missions, large scale financial support for the state should only be provided in the context of a viable and inclusive political settlement where there are reasonable prospects of sustained transition out of conflict. Um, both we and uh, CIGAR found that uh, development approaches, reconstruction approaches were often clumsy in the sense that we sought to impose Western models for the justice system, for the management of armed uh, forces, for economic institutions, uh, which weren't appropriate uh, to Afghan society. And we agree very much with Sigar's conclusion that the monitoring and evaluation showed that there was a culture of ticking boxes, as John said, uh, for checking whether the dispersal of money um, had achieved the required tasks rather than looking deeper about whether a particular project had a lasting uh, impact. And the poor monitoring and evaluation, of course, also contributed to this problem of poor institutional memory. Uh, two particular issues we found in relation to UK aid. We found that the UK had uh, put hundreds of millions of pounds into supporting the salaries of members of the Afghan National Police. This money was um, controlled through the Law and Order Trust Fund uh, for Afghanistan, which was managed by the UN Development Programme. We found this a, an inappropriate use of aid, because although aid may appropriately be used for civilian policing, it should not be used for uh, paramilitary operations, which was the primary, primary responsibility of the uh, Afghan National Police. Now, we're not saying that the UK shouldn't have been supporting forces combating the insurgency, but we're saying that foreign aid should not have been the finance uh, used for that purpose. Uh, and secondly, we found that UK scenario planning, although it started round about 2016, to consider the impact that growing insecurity and the possibility of state collapse had on the viability of programs, that it wasn't actually used to change the programs, uh, to reduce spending or change portfolio management until very late in the day. There was, from officials reporting up the line to London, an opti optimism bias, as Malcolm said, happy talk. People didn't want to tell the truth to a government who were committed to a particular policy uh, in Afghanistan. Now, we need to apply those lessons today in Afghanistan as well as elsewhere. Um, the current humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan, which our most recent information note describes, um, is enormous. Uh, and it's a crisis in part, of course, of our creation. Um, we don't believe that short-term fixes, that's providing food to hungry people, um, will bring longer-term economic security. So we need to focus on how we can do more than just provide food to build capacity of the Afghan economy. Otherwise, we'll be providing humanitarian aid year after year for uh, many years to come. We believe that disengagement from Afghanistan may accelerate the rate at which the benefits, the improved literacy, the um, uh, um, um, improved life expectancy that we were able to leave as part of our legacy will deteriorate more quickly. And it could, of course, create a power vacuum where other forces will gain uh, influence and power. Uh, in Afghanistan. Um, but above all, we need to achieve an international consensus amongst our friends and allies, other donor countries, about how to maximize the impact, both short term and longer term, of 
UK aid to Afghanistan, whilst minif minimizing the benefits which uh, the Taliban draw from that aid. So those are some principal findings, thank you. Sergio, thank you very much indeed for, for giving the UK perspective on these really difficult uh, issues. For those of you uh, uh, listening online, a number of you have uh, given uh, given uh, some comments in the Q&A, but if you're not aware of this, there's a Q&A function uh, on your screen uh, and you can ask any questions you wish from that. And I'm going to start, if I may, uh, by relaying one of the questions uh, from there, uh, uh, which is from uh, Masoud Amer, uh, who is for the, from the Center for Afghanistan Policy Studies. Uh, and this is the question. So he says, one of the fundamental issues in Afghanistan was that donors presupposed the existence of certain political values and institutional structures and uh, on the basis of that copied a western style liberal model of state building uh, but uh, but all fragile contexts uh, not all fragile contexts are the same so the, the question is what lesson can you learn from the afghanistan experience in terms of the relationship with the host uh, government or, or the host public authority uh, and uh, it, it, did, did we get that relationship wrong in Afghanistan? And if so, how could we have done it better? So perhaps I could start with you, John. Thank you. Uh, that's a very good question. And, you know, we've talked about it in many of our reports. Uh, we didn't, two problems. We, we didn't really uh, understand Afghanistan. We didn't understand how it worked as a country. We were lucky if we sent people who could speak the language, but very few people could. But you really do need to understand how the country works and how not only the government works, but also how the informal government works. And I'll cite one example. We, we assumed everyone uh, one of our goals was to create a, an effective and efficient judicial system. Well, we modeled it on, first of all, we built courthouses as if that helps a judicial system. I don't know how many empty courthouses that looked like courthouses in Rocky River, Ohio, or Columbus, Ohio, we built in, the, in Afghanistan, but we failed to realize that most Afghans have followed a very informal form of justice. And that's what the Taliban were offering, as much as you may dislike the Taliban, they were offering quick, informal, and uh, uncorrupt, incorrupt or uncorruptible uh, uh, justice. We were building courthouses and trying to impose uh, our understanding of judicial systems. So I think that's one thing we really do. And that means you have to listen to the people who live in Afghanistan or the people who live in Ukraine or Mali or wherever you're doing this to understand what they need and what they really want. Very clear. So Hugh. Um, well, I would uh, agree with that. There, were, there was a Sharia court um, system that uh, existed. It um, conflicted with some um, Western views about uh, human rights, uh, but it was... Um, accessible justice for many people it would operate quickly it would operate without you having to hire lawyers which was beyond the uh, means of course of a majority of the population so what john has said is absolutely right but that also applied to other institutions we tried to um we tried to um uh, force western models onto economic institutions we tried to um uh, train uh, members of the Afghan armed forces to uh, la largely illiterate people to use uh, weapon systems which uh, which weren't appropriate. So we weren't aware of the local traditions, culture, and capacity, and that's a lesson we must take away. Excellent. Now, have we got questions from the floor? If you'd indicate with your hand, there are so many questions coming from and I will try to get all of you maybe I'll take two or three at once so we have the lady here 
Please just wait for this, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Kate. Thanks very much for the presentation. It's very interesting. My name is Kate Clark from the Afghanistan Analyst Network. And we've been saying this sort of thing for years. So there's a certain... Um, deja vu. Uh, deja vu. But anyway, good to hear it. Rather than looking back, I think there's lots of things that can be said about what's been ha ha happening in the past. I wanted to ask two quick questions about what happens now and in the future. One is about the aid project at the moment. The donors have decided to go through the UN and NGOs rather than the government for political reasons. Your aid is funding UN agency headquarters, global um, spending by the, many of the UN agencies, maybe as much as one in $5 is currently going from spending in Afghanistan to fund UN agencies worldwide. It sounds like corruption. I mean, it's legal corruption, but it's problematic. Um, there are political reasons for that, but I wanted to ask you what you thought should be done. Secondly, we know that a lot of the Afghans, I'm sure other nationalities as well, made enormous money out of Afghanistan and the aid projects and the military spending. Some of those people are buying up property, they're looking to make contracts in Ukraine and elsewhere. Are you following the money? I keep asking this of uh, both UK and US and other governments, and there seems to be this desire to collectively forget Afghanistan. But we know that some of the people made money were abusive. Some of them historically have committed war crimes. They have used Afghanistan and the Western aid intervention as a platform for carrying on with their lives, making more money, getting contracts, as I said, building property. Are you following the money? Thanks very much. Two really interesting questions. I think we'll come straight to the speakers on those. Hugh, do you want to start? Um, well, yes, I'm aware um, that people have been making comments like this for uh, a good long time. And I think one of, for me, one of the central takeaways is how one changes the nature of government and parliament to um, challenge that opti optimism bias um, and to demand the truth from those who are working for the UK uh, on the ground. Um, I think there's little alternative to putting money through UN agencies and NGOs. If I take off my ICAI hat for a moment, I sit on the board of the International Rescue Committee, which has uh, 5,000 people employed on the ground in Afghanistan, making those difficult decisions about how you deliver in a way that avoids, wherever you can, a diversion of aid by the de facto authorities. And I've followed and seen good examples. And in our study, we heard of good examples of the UN um, stopping aid altogether when uh, local leaders were trying to um, decide who the beneficiaries should be. Um, so there really are, through those agencies, efforts to ensure that the aid goes for the purposes for which it's intended. Uh, but can I give you an assurance that no aid uh, leaks? Well, no, uh, I can't, which is why we phrased our um, talking point at the end of our information note um, in the way that we did, that we should be looking at how to maximize impact whilst minimizing the um, benefit to the um, uh, to the de facto authorities, to the Taliban. Um, in terms of um, recovering stolen aid from people who stole it and are now um, outside the country, it isn't something which our study uh, covered. Um, it, it's an important question, but I can't comment on that. I'm sorry. John. I, I'm happy to answer the question, and I, I agree with the, the questioner. We um, we're concerned not only of diversion by the Taliban or by nefarious people on the ground in Afghanistan or wherever, but we are also concerned about the high overhead costs. And that was the point I'm trying to make, and that's a point in, in my presentation, is we need to know the facts. And the UN hasn't been telling us the facts. 
They won't tell us how much overhead. They won't tell us how they operate. And this is a problem we faced, and this is a serious problem with international organizations. They view it as, you know, you're a donor, but so is, uh, you know, Saudi Arabia. So is some other country. So we don't need to give you the records. I think we need to know the facts and then make a determination. Then your parliament, our Congress can make a determination whether we're getting the biggest bang for the buck or are we wasting money, not by the Taliban stealing it, but by some official in whatever the international organization is. So we are insisting on that. And Congress has tasked us with finding the answer to how the UN, how the World Bank, and how other international organizations are operating in Afghanistan. And I think every parliament, every government that cares about their taxpayers' dollars should be insisting on that so you can make a determination. Secondly, following the money, if you look at our last quarterly report, I can't really talk about it, but that's what we are doing right now. And we did an issue, we issued a very small report on particular allegations about President uh, Ghani and his uh, uh, leadership stealing money from the palace as they left. And we said there was no evidence to support that. That had been in some Russian newspaper allegations. It just was physically impossible to haul out $500 million in the three helicopters. They just weren't big enough. That doesn't mean we have stopped looking at money being diverted the year leading up to the collapse. And we are in that, and I can't really discuss that in more detail, but we do care about. I, unlike ICAI, I have a law enforcement function as well as an auditing function. And so we, we prosecute, we've prosecuted about 300 some people for theft of US funds in Afghanistan, including the Afghans. So we, we're, we're gonna follow that. Excellent, right. Uh, questioner here, please. Uh, if you could. Wait for the microphone. And the sure. front row. Hi, always Rajput. I'm a defense and security researcher, and also ex-parliamentary candidate. Uh, did you try, uh, because we in UK, I'm not sure about the uh, US, but in UK we have diaspora communities from all over the world. And uh, did you try uh, the diaspora communities in Afghanistan or in other countries where you want to run an aid um, project, whether it's a short term or long term, did you send them because they understand the cultural values and also uh, Muslim or religious values, you know? So I think uh, if you send somebody from UK or Western countries, because there's a large number, they adopted the lifestyle and uh, they are not easy to manipulate or blackmail in Afghanistan or in other uh, local uh, countries, you know? Great. Could you... Thank you very much. And then there's a question here. There's just a gentleman here. Thank you very much. Um, two uh, things. Just introduce yourself. Sorry. Yes. My name is Aminullah Habibi, uh, Dr. Habibi from uh, Voland Media, uh, working uh, with two TV channels uh, in the UK on Afghanistan and Iran. Um, the two uh, questions or uh, two um, concerns rather. One of them is that uh, they would, the, whatever the aid expend, uh, spent in Afghanistan during the past 20 years, a capacity was built. And that capacity has in a sense put um, lots of uh, hurdles on the, uh, on the way of the Taliban and other terrorist groups to, to um, find foot soldiers for them because they are aware, aware of their rights, aware of their, and they're, they're educated. How could these aids be continued in a way that that capacity doesn't die, that continue to exist, that continue to be, uh, you know, thriving in Afghanistan, whether in the form of supporting the um, girls' education or providing alternative education for the girls. Um, and, uh, and the other um, um, concern or question is that, Currently, the aid that um, the United Nations is providing in Afghanistan is, uh, for, for example, I am in touch with the uh, Af um, you know, Afghan community in Afghanistan daily. And I see that, that um, for example, the uh, World Food um, Program um, aid that is going in Afghanistan, they're spent, they're, they're given like packages of food or wheat or, or, or wheat flour. 
but it is not connected to the empowerment of the community. For example, something like, you know, somebody does something, learns something, and then they get some, and some aid for that. And if this is uh, like a, a painkiller to give for, for one night or for one day, and that, and the next day they are uh, out of um, support. So how could this be connected to kind of uh, still empowering the Afghan community? Thank you very much. Great questions. I'm going to try and get some others. Uh, uh, gentlemen, just, just next to you, please. I've got you. Thank you very much for the uh, enriching uh, speak, uh, talks. Uh, my name is Saroj Dinizor. I'm a postdoctoral researcher with Rothbard University in the Netherlands. Uh, um, my question is to both of the speakers. Uh, so none of the speakers talk about the politics of the aid because there has been much uh, paradoxical role that the aid had played over the past 20 years from the role of building up patrimonial type of state in Afghanistan to the very uh, uh, devastating role of the uh, dual public sector, the PRTs that have been operating in Afghanistan. So I would like to see some more insights about those things. And then the other question is, uh, 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 your colleague talked about the engagement uh, mechanism about, uh, about now in Afghanistan. So. There is obviously a cost of engagement. Uh, you talk about the cost of disengagement. What about the cost of engagement? Because you're working with the government or with a de facto administration, you cannot even call them a government, that has been brutal. They're banning your own colleagues from working, the females, the NGOs, the UN. And I'm, 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 I'm not sure how you could kind of justify the kind of uh, engagement that you're talking about. Thank you. Very good, right. Um, John and then Sue. Uh, uh, quickly, um, the first question had to do with the diaspora and talking to the diaspora. And uh, uh, we do that and have done that. As a matter of fact, I'll be here for another week and talking to uh, a lot of the diaspora right here in London. So, and speaking at a couple of engagements, trying to do it. We try to do that. What we're talking about is when we designed programs before we went into Afghanistan or soon thereafter, we should have been talking to a lot of the Afghans. By we, I'm not talking about SIGAR. I don't design programs. I just look at them afterwards. It's aid, the various government entities, the World Bank, the UN, everybody should have been talking to Afghanistan. It doesn't mean you have to agree with everything, but at least learn about it. And there are many experts on Afghanistan who were totally ignored by our government. I can't speak for the UK or any other government. Uh, but we continue to do it. What's one of the reasons why I'm here? Because the UK actually has a better open door for poor Afghans who have fled than I know you have controversies over your immigration system, but you seem to have brought in a lot of Afghans who fled the Taliban, probably more than we did in the United States. So I'm finding that out. So kudos to the UK and UK citizens for, for uh, helping those people. Uh, Dr. Habibi, you, you talked about capacity surviving. I didn't quite understand that question to answer it, but um, I think you did talk about empowering more than just humanitarian aid, and I, I know you talked about that. That's a problem. Humanitarian aid is just feeding people or clothing people or giving medical care. It, it's, it doesn't develop anything, and I don't know how we do that now because one of the questioners talked about the politics involved. But none of our governments recognize the Taliban as a government. So they're doing things through international organizations or whatever, trying to keep from recognizing the government by dealing with them. I don't know how that's going to work in the future. Uh, and we're watching, we're waiting to hear how we approach that. It's a very difficult question. How much can you do to help the average Afghan who's facing starvation or is facing problems with education or with medical care without supporting a government that we don't support? Now, we have done that in other countries. I mean, we've given assistance to some really nasty regimes. You know, I don't think we're doing it now, but we gave assistance to uh, North Korea. We've given assistance in Syria. We've given assistance in other countries where we don't like and don't support those governments. So our government has done that in the past. Your government has too, I think. 
So, but it's a tricky question. At what point are you really helping a regime that you hate and you don't respect and you don't want to survive because it's really torturing its people? I, I don't have an answer to that. That's a very difficult question. I think that policymakers really have to uh, handle it. I, I'm sorry, I can't answer. Maybe you you can handle it better. So. No, I didn't mean to throw it on. Not easy. It's not not easy. easy. Um, look, first of all, in relation to speaking with the diaspora, as part of our study, we held uh, six um, focus groups with members, with Afghan citizens in the diaspora to focus on women and girls in Afghanistan, on humanitarian development programming, what from their perspective worked and what didn't, on state building, on um, uh, talking with a former UK DFID, um, Afghan members of staff about their experience, um, talking to academics in particular, Afghan academics, um, and uh, uh, one particular group looking at women and girls' access to education and health services. Um, also important is the extent to which aid programs uh, were built around the advice of Afghan uh, um, intended recipients uh, in the country. And um, my experience is that that um, declined over time because the security situation made it harder and harder for British officials to get out in the community and see what was happening on the ground. Um, that problem was mitigated to some extent by the UK and, of course, all other members of the coalition hiring Afghan members of staff who were able to get out. And now we have a particular problem of having to monitor the impact of aid programs, humanitarian programs, um, through third party monitors, um, uh, Afghan monitors on the ground who can explain whether aid is getting through um, and what impact it's having. And we will continue to um, do that as best we can, given the circumstances uh, on the ground. In terms of what the focus of humanitarian assistance should now be, the most immediate focus must of course be to preserve lives. But um, unless one does what in the trade is called humanitarian plus, that is to say to seek to build the capacity of Afghans to um, grow their own food, to uh, obtain the education that they need to um, um, operate their small scale, often small scale, um, businesses and um, farms in an effective way, unless that is provided, healthcare services are provided, then I can't see an end in a drought prone country to humanitarian aid being needed year after year after year. And we've seen in this year that the um, UN appeal has both been underfunded and reduced. And the um, the World Food Programme, for instance, has cut the ration it's providing and has had to take some very difficult decisions about who to prioritise and who not to prioritise because of a, a lack of funding. So one needs to do the best that you can with the funding that is available to preserve lives, but also to um, uh, uh, seek to build a future. Um, I mean, the harvest this year looks like being better than in previous years, but certainly in the northern half of the country, you know, drought continues and the food produced within the country will be um, significantly less than the food requirement uh, over, you know, the um, uh, uh, hungry period. We're going to run over just a couple of minutes uh, and we have I'll take some questions from the floor and then one question from the screen. So. This gentleman here, right? If you could wait for the microphone and introduce yourself. Here, right at the front. Right. 
So thank you, Rusi, for organizing such an important debate for the Afghan diaspora, for Afghanistan as a whole. Um, we understand that. Could you just introduce yourself? Sir? Oh, my name is Dr. Nurul Haq Nasimi. I am the founder of the Afghanistan and Central Asian Association, which is the Afghan leading charity in the United Kingdom, founded 24 years ago in 1999, after I migrated with my family to the United Kingdom. Um, we all understand everything is happening now in Afghanistan and the suffer of the people uh, and the people who are suffering for the past 45 years is the legacy of the Russian invasion. But at the same time, the time frame for the international engagement in Afghanistan was very, very short for the past 20 years. We knew that when the Obama administration announced of withdrawal of troops in 2014, at that time, we feel very, very sad. We realized, unfortunately, the international community will leave the Afghan people once again to the hand of neighboring countries. But then the main point which I have in my mind as a community leader, do you have any prevent a strategy? Because we are getting very close to the winter. Last year, hundreds of children lost their life because of the cold winter. And the second, do you have in mind of introducing a democratic opposition in exile? Thank you very much. Very good. I'm. Uh... I, there is a second session, so I think some of the people are going to have to come in in that second session. A quick but, one building on that. No, no. You, you. I think we'll. we'll uh, I'm going to get into a lot of trouble as chair if I if I extend this session much longer. We also have a question online from Dr. Uh, Nilam Raina uh, from the All Parliamentary Parliamentary Group on Afghan Women and Girls, and she asks: Does setting this task of maximizing impact but with minimal benefit to the Taliban, not contribute to the, I think it's a good phrase, the narrative of impossibility of working in Afghanistan right now. It feels like there is a narrative of impossibility. Uh, can we accept that narrative or do we need to work more with the, the de facto authorities in Afghanistan? So uh, I think, uh, uh, so Hugh, if you could start and then we'll come to John. Okay. Um, there's... A, a fundamental contradiction which all of the countries in the coalition face between military objectives which are necessarily short term. You can't plan a war that's going to take 20 or 30 or 40 years to conduct and uh, uh, a development program which will take 20 or 30 or 40 years to address the fundamental underlying problems. And we weren't able to marry the two in a way that the military action maximized the opportunity for the development partners and the development partners understood the military and security context. So that's some, got to be something we get better at. It's not my role to comment on UK foreign policy as a whole. So this question of supporting the democratic opposition in Exile is something you have to take up with foreign ministers rather than development ministers. Um, the question about a narrative of impossibility. Um, I would say just because something is difficult, if it is ethically the right thing to do, then donor countries should do it. It is extremely difficult to defend and protect the rights of women and the benefits they got during a 20-year period of support for education, uh, better health care, and better roles for women in uh, civil society. But don't give up, I think I would say. Talking to UK government officials, again, senior officials, about the situation post-withdrawal, they point to the fact that um, a, a number of uh, opt-outs were achieved after the Taliban made their announcement initially that uh, NGO workers 
women uh, should, should, should not use women to provide humanitarian assistance. And later they extended that ban on women to um, uh, UN agencies. Um, there is a, 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 not a perfect, but an opt out that applies to health provision. And on a local basis with local commanders, wider opt outs have been achieved in certain certain you know certain parts of the country to enable women aid workers to work with women recipients um, of assistance it's very far from perfect and things seem to be getting worse rather than better but uh um you know, the UK takes the view that we should stick in there and do the best that we can to um, protect humanitarian assistance uh, for women. Um, I will say for as long as possible, but that assumes that it's going to end and the British government wouldn't want to, to make that assumption. John. I'll quickly answer that. I, I, I don't do policy. I do process. So uh, these are they're excellent questions. These have to be answered by our policymakers, which states as the Congress and the president. But I would throw this out for consideration. Where have we succeeded in doing reconstruction in a war zone? I can, or post-war zone. And I can only think, in my humble opinion, and again, I'm just a simple country lawyer from Ohio, but the two instances I know are Korea and right here in Europe, except you're not part of Europe anymore. No, uh, uh, you know, I know, I, know I, 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 I digress. But uh, uh, I had to get one Brexit joke in, so it's, it's an American tradition. But, uh, you know, uh, the Marshall Plan after World War II. So I, I think before we go into this again, we ought to look at where it's worked, not just where it's failed. It's failed in Afghanistan. Some people say it's failed in Iraq definitely failed in Vietnam. I'm old enough to remember that. But uh, worked in the uh, Europe after World War II. And now there wasn't terrorist groups operating and there was no war going on. In Korea, you know, they, it was a, a stop in the hostilities, but it worked. But that's where they joined the timelines of the military with the timelines of economic development. So that's a good point that I think you you made about how you got to keep those in mind when you design something like this. So you got to have the plan and you got to stick with it. Can't say, well, we're going to win the war in 12 uh, months and you know everybody be home for Christmas. That doesn't work. Particularly doesn't work for development aid. We're going to have to draw this session to a close right now. Uh, apologies to those all in the hall who haven't been able to ask their questions. I'm also conscious that we had at least a dozen questions online asked after 10 to 12. So if you do want online to get your question answered, please ask it early on in the session. And those of you who weren't able to get your question answered during this session, put it on the Q&A again <laughs> for the next session because we, we've got two excellent speakers for the next session. Please all remain seated while we shift uh, the panel around. And can I ask you all to, to join me in thanking our speakers for getting us. Thank you very much. Excellent questions.
Okay, we're back on. Thank you. Um, so welcome to this second session. Um, if what has already been an incredibly uh, interesting and, and detailed conversation. My name is Emily Winterbotham and I'm the director of RUSI's Terrorism and Conflict Research Group. And that includes um, a quite extensive piece of work and program on Afghanistan. Uh, Afghanistan is a country which I know very well. Um, I've worked on it since 2009 um, and lived there from 2009 to 2015, uh, including a few years at the European Union delegation uh, as a political advisor um, to on the Afghan peace process. For this second panel, um, we're going to take a little bit more of a kind of deeper dive uh, into the conversation we've already started to have. So thank you to all of you who want to ask questions, including online. I'm going to keep a note of them and we hopefully can return to them in the Q&A session. Um, we're going to start with Nigel Thornton, um, who works for ICAI, and he's going to talk a little bit more about ICAI's role, its mandate, its methodology, um, and in particular, picking up on um, some of the details that were introduced earlier in regard to the evaluation of UK aid 2014 to 2021 that was released in November last year. We'll then turn to David Young, who's an analyst at CIGAR, um, who's going to look at uh, the perspective from CIGAR, particularly in around the challenges um, that we've faced in terms of personnel uh, within the US State Department, the recruitment of that, the issues of uh, short turnovers, um, and the implications that that has to actually make progress uh, for, for aid um, on Afghanistan. And I think perhaps reflect about some of the challenges in terms of why it's difficult uh, to form lessons learned in relation to Afghanistan and elsewhere. We, I also have Angelique Lecour with me. She's going to join us for the Q&A. Uh, she is the author of the report which was mentioned about the humanitarian situation that was released in May this year, um, particularly focused on humanitarian, uh, the current humanitarian state of affairs in Afghanistan since the fall of the government. So with that being said, I will hand over to Nigel. Thank you very much. And... Uh... Good, yes, it's just afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Yes, my name is Nigel Thornton. Um, a little word about ICAI itself. The Independent Commission for Aid Impact has been around for about, well, since 2011. And it actually has three legs. Uh, first are the commissioners, of whom Sir Hugh is one uh, you met earlier. Commissioners are appointed by uh, ministers. In this case, the uh, the the moment the Minister of State for International Development. Um, there is a small secretariat based in uh, Whitehall, and then there is a contracted service provider who uh, uh, gather the evidence and present that evidence to commissioners who then take a view on uh, what their findings will be. Um, I'm from that contracted service provider, a Gullah Supplied Knowledge, and I've been I've had the, the privilege to be involved with ICAI since its inception. Um, and have, in that period, we've been involved in about 100 reports, and I've led 18. Um, so, and, and I think it's just worthwhile just saying a little bit about that, and I'll go into a minute in, in a minute, I'll just say a little bit more about the mandate. But I just want to start off really by honouring all of those people who served in Afghanistan those who lost their lives, those who spent time there, and not least the Afghans who supported the UK aid programme. And we'll come back, we've heard the importance of those Afghans to the UK's effort, and we'll come back to their role in a minute. Um, the mandate of ICAI is to, as you've heard already, look at the overseas development assistance spend only. It is not an organisation that looks at uh, foreign policy or defence policy. And uh, commissioners like Sir Hugh set the agenda of what we look at. And those are that's then articulated into a terms of reference. And for this exercise, we looked at the relevance of the assistance provided to Afghanistan, its effectiveness, and how coherent was that with the other efforts being made by the international community, but also by the other uh, uh, activities undertaken by Her Majesty's government, now His Majesty's government. Fundamentally, ICAI seeks to improve the effectiveness and value for money 
of the UK age spend. And what we do is we, we score for full reviews. We actually have a traffic light system. And often people just focus on what those traffic lights are, whether it's a red, whether it's a, a, a red amber, an amber green or a green school. Now, you'll notice there's no amber there. There's no sitting on the fence. The idea there is that Aikai uh, comes to a conclusion about whether this is a good exercise or a poor exercise. Uh, the assistance for Afghanistan was scored amber red. Often people ask us, well, what standard do you hold the British government to? What are the standards? You know, do you have, are you looking at the best in class? And, and really what we've discovered over 10 years is that the best idea is really to say, well, what does the UK uh, hold itself to? And is it achieving that? And that breaks down into two fundamental questions. What did HMG say it would achieve? What would it do in terms of strategy, in terms of its outcomes and its outputs? And then what also, what did HMG said it should do in terms of its policy, in terms of its standards, and in terms of previous lessons learned? And as it were, it's about holding a mirror up to nature. It's, a, it's a, ICAR's role as a watchdog is not to come in there and be uh, have big teeth, as a watchdog would do, but actually to be a critical friend, to hold a mirror up and say, are you doing what you said you would do? Are you doing it in the way you said you would do it? And, and the objective is to improve, it's to help uh, next time. On this particular piece of work, which you can find online at the ICAI website, um, is it was what, called, what was called a, a country programme review. We're looking at not just one programme, but all of the activities over a period of time, or most of the activities, actually. It's not possible within the resources we have to look at what was, in this case, a, a multi-million pounds of spending between 2014 and 2021 in forensic detail. We only have about nine months to a year to do an exercise, and actually it would take years to do that. Um, so we looked at that period 2014 to 2021, and um, what that meant was we had to focus on the most important, the largest areas of spending pro in the programmes, uh, the most significant issues that were dealt with. One thing we didn't do in this report was really focus on corruption. And John Sopko has already mentioned the importance of it. I think, I think personally, I would now say, actually, I think what we could have done is done a little bit more on corruption, but there just simply wasn't time. We could have done a whole report on corruption. Um, like I had previously done a report uh, about uh, eight years ago, nine years ago, on uh, on fraud in Afghanistan. And as a result of that, it was decided not to do a piece on corruption this time. Reviews have different characteristics. Some of them are about a technical view of how to deliver aid effectively. Some are more forensic. Actually, there's a problem here. We need to dig into it. Some actually have the nature of therapy. If you're interviewing people and interviewing officials, quite often they want to unburden themselves because they have been something through something which is very difficult and quite traumatic. We were interviewing and doing our work after the withdrawal. A lot of what we did was therapy, actually. We were listening to people tell their stories in ways that they hadn't been able to do before. And that's one of the great privileges of ICAI is that people will, uh, in confidence, share with us things that they are not necessarily able to tell their superiors or their superiors are not necessarily able to hear, but we can mediate for them. And we can then tell that story to the wider public and to uh, parliamentarians. And I have to say over 10 years, that has been an incredible privilege that people have been able to share and be honest with us about how they have found uh, doing their work. So as, as Sir Hugh has said, what did we do? We did 74 interviews with uh, UK officials, some very senior, some people who had really got their hands dirty and, and been on the ground. We spoke to the six focus groups that you've just heard of uh, at the diaspora. We looked also at many internal surveys that are continuing to uh, generate information to try and find the voice of Afghans over the country. And we also, as, as, as you've heard, looked at 5,000 documents. That's not normal for an ICAR review. That's probably about five times more than we would usually do. 
And as Sir Hugh said, what we were able to do is look at documents that aren't in the public domain. We were also able to look at emails. We were able to look at um, lots of reporting. Now, what kind of documents were they? Well, a lot of them are program documents, documents, annual reports, which go back from uh, program implementation staff back up to, to, the, to, to headquarters about what is being done, how well it's being done. Uh, program completion reports, reports that at the end of a program where they say, actually, this is what we really did. This is what we really achieved. Evaluations where they were done, and they weren't necessarily done as often or as comprehensively as we would have liked. But then there's also, as I said, confidential reporting of other sorts as well. Uh, reporting, for instance, to, to uh, the Joint Intelligence Committee uh, uh, that we were able to have sight to. And what did we find? We've heard from Hugh many of the key messages, and I'll just pick out a few more themes that underlie that. And I want to go back to a point that Hugh has mentioned, which was unlike most of the work that ICAI does, and you can see here a fairly traditional image of, of, of international development, the work in Afghanistan, development was not an end in itself. We weren't actually seeking to forward the SDGs, the, the Sustainable Development Goals, although they were, re they were referenced. Fundamentally, we were about supporting uh, other priorities. We were, aid was in the service of security. The, uh, we, and we weren't supporting a domestic agenda. For those old enough, you may not remember the Paris Declaration on Aid Effectiveness, the aid effectiveness agenda was talking, was saying that actually you needed to do several things. Good aid was would align behind national priorities and it would be harmonized internationally. We weren't aligning behind national priorities because what we were doing, we were supporting an international agenda that was fundamentally from the outside being imposed on the country. Now, so UK aid sought to build a state in order to reduce threats to the UK. I just want to reiterate what the National Security Council's objectives were for Afghanistan for the UK. Firstly, objective one, counter direct threats to the UK interest. And objective two, support a viable Afghan state. That was the priority development. Well, we've heard that already, but, but priority one was priority one. It was about counter direct threats to the UK interest. Now, we know from our work, and I know from 20 odd work years, now 30 years working in international development, that the UK knew what knows what effective aid looks like. In, uh, Andrew Mitchell, the current International Development uh, Secretary of State, uh, sorry, Minister of State, but was the Secretary of State when ICO was founded, he talks about the UK being a development superpower. In fact, Previous prime ministers have said that. Now, and he also recognises that perhaps we've lost that. But the UK knows what effective aid looks like. And it knew from decades of learning, reporting shows that. And technically, the UK was capable and knowledgeable. And what we found, talking to staff and looking at the reports, is the UK was clear-eyed about what it was achieving. The development staff were clear-eyed about what was really happening in Afghanistan. They knew, they, they knew how it compared to UK policy, to standards and best practices. And they knew there was a gap. And that post-2014, which is the period we looked at there, they continued to deliver, even though it was far from best practice. And much of other reporting from elsewhere in the UK government was clear-eyed about what was really happening. But it continued, aid continued to flow actions continued. And two issues really to draw out, and we've already heard mention of them. One was that building that viable state would take time. And yet, it was only in 2016 that after considerable lobbying from the international development people in the UK government, did the National Security Council change its, its strategic documents to acknowledge that it would take decades for the strategic objective of a viable state to be achieved. And just to reinforce what John has said earlier on, there was this tacit statement throughout all the documentation up to that point that we could achieve that viable state 
very in a matter of months or, or just a couple of years, rather than the reality of decades. And it was only in that 2016 documentation that you start to see the development wallers being able to push that through and, and, and make it clear. That's interesting. And the second thing that comes through again and again and again, consistency in the docu in, in documents, is this point about a viable state not, not only needed to be capable, but also needed to be legitimate or have sufficient legitimacy. And that sufficient legitimacy, the political settlement that would enable that sufficient legitimacy would require engagement with the Taliban. Absolutely, that's clear. And that's through all the documentation right from the start that we see. And again, UK, UK officials, they knew that. They knew that also that any political settlement would be messy. It would require continuous negotiation. There would be no grand bargain, no magic bullet moment. It would be something that would happen. So you have that understanding, you have that knowledge, and yet, and yet. And senior voices said to us at the same time, exactly what we've, we've heard this morning, we didn't really understand Afghanistan. We were fooling ourselves. It's hard to build legitimacy with people for whom the government are kicking down the doors in the night. So why was that disconnect? Now we've heard a little bit today about happy messages um, and that, that's true to an extent, but, but actually from what we saw, those messages were going up, the real messages were going up. Uh, it may not have been in the brigadier who came back after six months, but it certainly was in the aid officials. And what we saw there is that there was a lack of coherence between Afghanistan and London often. Messages going up from, uh, from British Embassy Kabul weren't necessarily being heard in London. And absolutely, the UK development uh, uh, activities were subject to shorter time term security priorities, absolutely. But ultimately, and with all respect to, to, to US uh, colleagues here, ultimately the agenda was not the UK's. Ultimately, the agenda was driven by US military timescales, US military agendas. And again and again, that's what comes back. And as he, as he has said, ultimately it was about prioritizing the transatlantic relationship in the way that we did our work. So what actually happened then in that response, given all of that, that disconnect, and yet we had that knowledge, and yet, yet we, we, couldn't, we couldn't really move because of the, the external agenda that was being set by, by others. Well, post, 2014, the program changed, most clearly from 2016. And what the UK officials did is they reduced the number of bilateral programs considerably. So we, we reduced that. We moved to sh sharing the risk by putting more and more funding through the multilateral programming through the UN system uh, and the world, but with the World Bank, so that by 2021, 90% of the spend was actually through the international multilateral system. And we worked with the multilateral system to improve their monitoring, to try and, and, uh, and, and overcome some of the challenges that John has mentioned earlier on. And then also by the end of the period, by, by the time we look at 37% of the whole spend was actually on humanitarian. And by that stage, we were, we were, we were supporting funding that was responding to shocks. You know, in a way, what we'd done is we'd, we were no longer building, we were, we were responding. And we can see, as Hugh has said, um, the achievement of some key outputs. But what do they really add up to? Well, for start off, from our point of view, this mirror, did you do what you said you'd, you'd do? The, the UK never really asked itself that question. There was no overall evaluation, which is what you kind of expected, the largest overseas aid program, uh, overseas country program. There was no evaluation that the UK did of its entire activity through the period that we looked at. Um, it did individual programming. So it never asked itself the question, maybe it was a too difficult, that question. What you see is a focus on output reporting only, back to the point that's been made earlier on. Not really how much does this hill of beans add up to, but how many beans were there? And, uh, and there were claims for success at the output level because that justified the spending. And that's back to the point that's been made earlier on. But the consistent message from those annual reports and those project completion reports I mentioned 
is that they really they were just limited gains. There were very limited gains and constrained gains. And there wasn't anything at the, in, the, in the jargon at the, the outcome level or, or the purpose level. It really wasn't there. You couldn't see that change happening. And any of that change really was not sustainable even when it was achieved. So that output to purpose case, are your outputs achieving the purpose, consistently is, is a failure. It, it, it just isn't there. So the programming is doing the outputs, but it's not achieving that overall purpose. And that's consistently lacking across all the programs. Now, was it a failure of the assumptions on which the program was depended? My argument, I think probably, and this is personal, this isn't ICAI, is that, that the, the move that you see to reporting on outputs over the period is really a recognition, a tacit recognition of a strategic failure, that there's a recognition you can't actually achieve the outcomes. So what you do is you justify the funding back to London based on the achievement of those, those much more definable outputs. Hughes mentioned the, um, the police program, lot for which our report, which I would ask you to read online if you can do, it's very critical of that, that program. 70 million pounds a year, a political commitment to support the police. Um, after our work finished, we had uh, sight of the project completion report for that police program, which was only delivered in 2023. And that police program says this, we need to be open to unpalatable truths. We need to stop a, political, a particular project or program when the assumptions become critically challenged. And I think for us, that's the takeaway for the entire aid program in Afghanistan. We need to fail faster. And, and the key lesson, I think, going forward, for any end of the any, any context is how is we need to fail faster. We need to get the information, the monitoring evaluation. We need to listen to the people on the ground. And then, and specifically, as, as we heard earlier on, the Afghans on the ground who really knew what was going on. And then we need to fail fast. And it comes down to that need to really look in the mirror to heed the lessons, to admit the unpalatable truths, and to be both be prepared to change course quickly, have those scenarios, and then to actually do it when we need to. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. This microphone's off. We'll, we'll now turn to David Young. Sorry, I'll project. Thank you, Emily, and thank you all for coming, and to Rusi and Aikai for hosting. Um, if you'll indulge me, I'd like to set the stage with a few quotes from an important Afghanistan study that I think are rather revealing. Uh, first, U.S. expectations of the time required to achieve effective results in Afghanistan were generally unrealistic and overambitious. The U.S. had too much confidence in the applicability of technical solutions to complex social and economic development problems, and too much confidence in the transferability of U.S. values and experience. This overconfidence meant that too little attention was paid to local circumstances and values in the preparation and execution of aid activities. And finally, the use of aid for short-term political objectives tended to distort sound economic rationale for development, which weakened longer-term political interests for the United States. Now, these are not Cigar's words, uh, although they certainly could be. They bear striking resemblance to our Lessons Learned products and to many of ICAI's as well. Uh, instead, USAID wrote this in 1988, 13 years before 9-11. And the premise of the report was covering 30 years of development assistance from 1950 all the way to 1980. And much, as you may may not may, be, may not be surprised to learn, much of the contents of this 200-page report um, detail all of the challenges and obstacles that we would eventually face over the last two decades. Um, and this, of course, is a common problem in the U.S. government, and I'm sure other governments as well 
how do you uh, learn from something? How do you learn lessons instead of simply identifying them, but actually implementing them, going that next step and implementing them? And so in this particular case, why? Why didn't we take this document that was sitting in USAID's vault for 13 years and learn the lessons and be ready for those two decades? Well, the answer, I think, in large part, uh, focuses on our personnel and the personnel that we bring to this problem set. So in order to learn lessons, you've got to have people who can read 200 page documents as they prepare for missions like this, and then use those documents to influence the policy making process through deliberative processes where you provide guidance notes and policy memos and whatnot. And all that requires staff to review and shuffle all of this paper and make sure that you have a polished uh, analytical product for policymakers. Unfortunately, U.S. government officials did not have these staff uh, going into Afghanistan, and it is a recurring problem. Uh, for Afghanistan in particular, as John Sopko mentioned, after Vietnam, the U.S. government collectively decided that we weren't ever doing this again. So therefore, why bother preparing for something if you're never going to do it again? And that met, led to the Department of Defense closing training houses and uh, and shuttering um, uh, different military units. USAID uh, closed or um, uh, cut staff by 83 percent following the, the Vietnam War. And so we thought that we could wave a magic wand and say, we're never doing this again. And then little did we know, a couple decades later, we did two of them at the same time. So by the time 2001 rolled around, um, uh, our corruption expertise, just to take one example, within the U.S. government was extremely limited so that it became much more likely that the aid we would provide to Afghanistan uh, would be subject to far more corrupt, sub subject to more corruption and potentially even worsened that corruption. And so, and that's exactly what happened. Not until seven years into the war did we start taking corruption seriously. Up, to, up until that point, the idea was, the premise was that we could uh, sort of excise corruption with a scalpel and, it, and not let it hurt the main effort of what we were trying to do. But it turned out that the strategy itself was completely undermined because the Afghan government had become essentially uh, a, a massive organiz organized criminal network. And so, uh, and corruption, of course, wasn't the only circumstance in which we, our uh, assistants and our personnel suffered as a result of our um, uh, sort of lack of institutional investments in our own, uh, in our own people. Uh, we had Navy SEALs who were, who are typically, as you probably know, their expertise is capturing and killing enemies. That is their premise. And in Afghanistan, they were frequently used to build meaningful relationships with Afghan elders in communities, something that they're completely unqualified for. Not their fault that they didn't do a great job. They weren't qualified for it because there were few personnel who were qualified and they had to lean on others who were not. Same thing applies to our civil affairs units in the military. Um, we took uh, chemical people who specialized in chemical warfare in the, U in the U.S. Army and converted them into civil affairs units using a few weeks of PowerPoint trainings and whatnot and thought, you know, we could just check that box. And it turned out very poorly. And this really isn't just a problem in Afghanistan. It is uh, it is across the U.S. government in all the in many of the places that where we do and try to reduce violent conflict. And this is and the problem is especially pronounced in our civilian agencies. It's at state and USAID, which are really the centerpiece or two centerpieces of our efforts working in conflict affected environments because these conflicts are inherently political and need political politically oriented institutions to try and address them. So just as a few examples of how those civilian institutions, state and aid, uh, are suffer in terms of the kind of investments they put into their personnel, we have about 8,000 foreign service officers in our State Department, our, our, our diplomats. That is equal to the number of musicians that we have in our armed forces, right? That is no judgment on the merits of having 8,000 musicians in our armed forces. It is simply a reflection of our priorities. It's an undeniable reflection of those priorities. This manifests in trainings as well. Uh, if you're an, a US Army major, you have to go to something called the Command General Staff College. You go and spend a year full-time training how to improve your craft. They do things like they learn new analytical lenses. They do critical, uh, uh, critical thinking exercises. They have adapting for uncertainty. The idea is 
learn how to think, not what to think, right? And that's because DOD knows that um, that expertise can prim primarily comes from training and reflection to improve institutional investments in their people. And they have the funding and the resources to put their, oh, excuse me, to put their money where their mouth is and to actually train these people and invest in them. Meanwhile, for perspective, USAID struggles to send its staff for a few days of training, right? And that really is a difference in uh, priorities and especially in resources that they can bring to bear. This manifests, this difference also manifests in uh, culturally, in, in the culture of these different institutions. In 2004, the State Department, uh, in response to a lot of the problems that I'm describing, created something called the Civilian Response Corps. And it included 250 civilian officials, like a cadre of these officials who were on standby for deployment uh, to conflict affected environments, contingency operations, within a few days notice. And because the idea was we don't want to cannibalize from other agencies and programs, we want to have a dedicated staff who is ready for missions like these. Certainly a, 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 a terrific idea built on many decades of experience. Problem is, uh, within a few years, policymakers and Congress decided this was extremely wasteful. They said these people are just sitting around waiting for a conflict, waiting for a war, and therefore that's 250 salaries that are going out the door. Contrast that with a completely different cultural lens in our Department of Defense. We have armor battalions and artillery brigades who are literally doing the exact same thing, sitting around, waiting for conflict, but training and cultivating themselves and honing their craft. And it does not seem the least bit wasteful for that. And in fact, it seems quite prudent. Most people would argue that the, what makes a good military is extensive training and preparation for the time when they are actually needed. And so that contrast is something that really handicaps our civilian and military, uh, our civilian uh, institutions. There's also oversight imbalances. When a lot of our, as many of you know, a lot of our efforts in these conflict affected environments are uh, administered through programs, right? And every program has what's called, in the US anyway, a contract officer or an agreement officer. And this person oversees all disbursements on that contract going out the door. They're looking for signs of corruption, signs of fraud, misallocation, things like that. And the more that the more money that individual has to oversee, of course, the more likely it is for things to slip through the cracks. Their bandwidth for keeping an eye on safeguarding against those problems is limited as each person is responsible for an ever-increasing amount of money. USAID's average over the past few years is $65 million. A single person is overseeing sometimes thousands of transactions, benefiting maybe tens of thousands of beneficiaries, for programs like this and makes it much easier to, for things to slip through the cracks. Contrast that with DOD, which measure, which averages a quarter of that in terms of oversight, uh, managing oversight of, um, of contracts and spending. In Afghanistan, uh, in fact, there were times where USAID stat contracting officers or agreement officers oversaw $100 million in disbursements. And this is 10 times the amount that's required or the, that USAID says is the best practice, that USAID, a contract officer or an agreement officer, shouldn't be in charge of more than $10 million per person. And in Afghanistan, it was 10 times that amount at certain times. So to build institutions that can reduce violent conflict, you've got to have good people. And you've got to have good people in, 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 because we're speaking about Afghanistan, in Afghan institutions so that they can oversee the programs and projects. You've got to have good people in our uh, governments who are helping build those institutions. And the trick is, is that you need them when you don't need them. You need them at a time when you have the bandwidth and the time to cultivate them, to train them, to hone them, to help them uh, build their craft. And uh, that's that is the, the the real the real trick because that seems to many to be the time where we don't need them because why don't we wait until we've got another war on our hands before we ramp up this effort? The problem is is that that's usually far too late, as we saw in Afghanistan. So a lot of the challenges that we faced in Afghanistan were not in our control, and it's really important to say that up front. But among the ones that were within our control. Um, most trace back 
to getting the right people into the right jobs at the right times. And that makes it an, an, a, a very, very important area of reform because it's within our control and bang for buck, it would have a pretty tremendous impact for those investments. Um, now, none of this is to say that state and aid are perfect and that if only uh, the external obstacles were to get out of their way, suddenly they would be fantastic. SIGAR has spent years holding state and aid accountable for very poor decisions in Afghanistan, rightly so, over the years. But if you zoom out, what you find is that our system, our collection of agencies, the, the policymakers that make them up often, that, it, that these agencies are set up for failure for work in our in conflict affected environments. And it's critical to, to address that. So I'll pause there and uh, look forward to your questions. Thank, <clears throat> thank you so much. Um, I know that there are lots and lots of questions. Um, I'm actually just going to turn immediately to one uh, which is online because I'd like to bring Angelique in. Um, and there is a question about uh the role of foreign aid in eradicating poverty um apparently and i i do not know the figures uh i can't verify them but the author claims that um poverty in afghanistan started increasing in 2007 from 30 percent to 75 percent in 2019 and it's now at 97 percent and so the question is around why the donor community has not considered this in their annual planning but i just wondered if you could reflect on poverty levels and particularly the humanitarian situation um, that you've been looking into before i then if you wave at me in the audience i'll try and make sure we get to your questions as well in terms of the figures Sorry, in terms of the figures, uh, they vary between 90% and indeed 97%. Um, poverty is at the core of every single uh, intervention in Afghanistan, and I think all donors are, are actually um, uh, taking this into account when engaging in, in, uh, in, in, in Afghanistan. To give you uh, just a few figures to give you an idea of the scale of the challenge, um, the UN earlier this year um, assessed that about 28.3 million people would require humanitarian assistance this year. And they revised the figure um, last month, actually, to move it to 28.8 million. So this figure has increased by 500,000 in just six months. And this is for the period covering June to December. Um, but now the scale of the, of the challenge is huge. But humanitarian organizations working in Afghanistan face an increasing, increasingly um, difficult challenges, which range from operational challenges to also underfunding. Um, and um, the UN has launched a series of appeals since the fall of Kabul in, uh, in 2021. So the first one uh, was around six, 600 million in 2021. The, the, the appeal for last year was the highest ever um, requested by the UN, which was 4.4 billion. Um, to this day, it's been 74% founded. Um, and for this year, for 2023, the appeal was supposed to be at 4.6. Last month, the uh, different ag agencies have reassessed the situation in Afghanistan, have reduced this request um, to 3.2, which is extremely significant and is a reflection of underfunding, increasing uh, operational challenges, which I will, will mention in, in a minute. Um, and also the fact that humanitarian organizations simply can't cope with the scale of the, of the problem. So I think poverty is indeed at the, at the core of each intervention, but there is so much you can do with the restrictions in place. For this specific um, information note, so it was a bit different from the evaluation that Nigel mentioned earlier. Um, we interviewed FCDO, but we mainly interviewed um, UN agencies in Afghanistan and uh, INGOs. And the accounts we got from all those interviews were very sobering and humbling. Um, and the scale of the challenges every single humanitarian worker is experiencing in Afghanistan is, is, um, is, is just difficult to relate in an eight-page or 15-page document. Um, the restrictions, I think three takeaways we got from those interviews uh, were that the security situation has, has improved, even if it's far from from actually being ideal. And I can also provide some figures on this because um, at the UN it released the number of casualties and the number of um, terrorist groups that are, or, num or members are supposed to be still operating in Afghanistan. And this number is growing. Um, in terms of the, 
the, the so the first one was the the restrictions that are being imposed by the Taliban. The second one is the question of engagement, which we touched upon, which I think would deserve its own uh, panel or or session actually. And the other um, issue is obviously the growing curbs on women and girls' uh, rights in Afghanistan. But when it comes to um, to uh, security versus restrictions. Everyone we talked to said to us, the security situation has improved. We've been able to reach um, uh, territory and, and provinces and locations we could never, never actually reach prior to the fall of Kabul. But this comes with a set of restrictions that the Taliban are imposing on NGOs and INGOs, and they range from uh, the Taliban asking to join the, um, the teams um, during field visits to uh, trying to influence recruitment within within those NGOs. So this is the type of challenges um, organizations are facing on a daily basis. Um, in terms of the um, of women, women, I don't know whether that I could actually move on to women's rights or whether I should actually stay on those uh, very specific humanitarian issues. Let's maybe just pause there because I know we've got a few questions here and then, you know, we've got 10 minutes remaining. Okay. Uh, um, so, Mark, is there a... I'm going to take all three in one go. So it's Mark here, one at the front, and then one at the back in a minute. Oh, Mark Bowden. I used to be the uh, Deputy Special Representative of the Secretary General and Resident Coordinator, Humanitarian Coordinator between 2012 and 2017. Uh, and my question is really about policing, uh, because I was responsible for the management of Lotfa, a poison chalice. Uh, and uh, uh, I think I was interested in Sir Hugh's comments uh, and, and latter comments, because it seems to me that policing, uh, that, that it was inappropriate for aid expenditure. The, the issue is who does pay for policing? Uh, and uh, I was uh, used to be the RCHC in Somalia, exactly the same problems. Uh, that policing is an orphan. You find policing in free, frequently securitized. Uh, the World Bank can't touch it because of their mandate. It ends up with the with the, with the UN. Uh, and there's a real dilemma here, both in terms of reconstruction uh, and and in aid terms. Uh, I think we try to work on due diligence, but I have to say that the donor community was just as divided, and I didn't see the UK taking a particularly proactive stance uh, in defending the issues of human rights uh, or, or other areas in there. So uh, it's just to, to slightly say, isn't this something you, uh, the Commission should highlight in f for future issues, that, that one of the major gaps in Reconstruction is that of uh, managing policing? Just hand it over <laughs> um hi my name is Darius Nassimi and um I'm from the Afghan I'm the first British Afghan conservative candidate and I'm from the Afghanistan and Central Asian Association which is a charity helping um Afghan refugees in the UK we also delivered a humanitarian program inside Afghanistan funded by DFID for three years and I'm also uh, the founder of a new company called Suzani Capital which seeks to increase investment uh, and trade, British trade between the UK and Central Asia. And first of all, I just wanted to say thanks. Uh, thank you to Britain and its allies. Aside from all the negatives, I think we had lots of positives in Afghanistan as well. And, you know, you can't you, you fix a, a state like Afghanistan in 20 years. It requires a lot, lot, lots of investment and reform. But I just wanted to make a comment in addition to a question. And um, one thing that I think is is heavily overshadowed, and I think um, so. So he uh, he he referred to that point, which is there was lots of ethnic uh, inequalities in Afghanistan um, since two thousand and one, and in particular inequality in in aid distribution. There was like a north south divide. Lots of money was spent in certain parts of the country, and as you mentioned as well, there was lots of influence from certain ethnic groups. Um, for example, uh, you know, the majority of Afghans working in embassies came from a certain part of the country. The majority of Afghans working in aid agencies came from a certain ethnic group. And, and in addition to that, the majority of the money that was actually spent on Afghanistan went outside in the end. It wasn't spent on a grassroots level in the country. So what are your thoughts on that, especially now with the return of the Taliban? Obviously, the ethnic inequalities have worsened because it's become like a pro, sorry, a single led ethnic state so 
that that is one question and the second is what are your thoughts on the future of a to afghanistan and what would you do differently will you send will the aid go to the taliban or through other channels i understand that people are facing extreme poverty but how how do you weigh up the do you send money to the taliban or do you let people suffer and thirdly it's more around business would you mind if we because we've got um, another question yeah, there. And it's we've just got... the, the, the other point about this. Do you think there will be um, investment opportunities for British companies in the future? Great. Quite a few questions there. There was just one final one. Sorry, just at the back. It's next to you. And then I'm going to ask our panellists to sort of take whichever of those questions they want and, and wrap up so we don't run over too much. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Josh Arnold Forster, uh, like Malcolm, I was involved in the early stages of developing government policy, UK government policy on this. Um, first question is, um, you mentioned that um, we we did not make uh, inroads into bringing elements of the Taliban into a provisional government, despite the fact that officials, and also in my experience anyway, right from the start, senior British military personnel were saying the same thing. Or every every most of the campaigns British military have fought over since the end of the Cold War uh, have involved talking to terrorists uh, yes. since the end of the World War Two actually. So why wasn't that progress made? Given there was there wasn't that much unity between MOD and the FCO on Afghan policy, but at least on that there was. Um, and then the second question, which is more up to date, which is you quite rightly point out the Afghan National Police were a paramilitary force. This has been completely denied by the FCO in their response to your report. Who's right, you or them? Great questions. Let's start with Nigel and work our way down. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, so let's start with let's start with the police, shall we? So um, the what that I mentioned that uh, project completion report, the internal report of about the police, and I mentioned that. And that, that describes the, uh, the police as military adjacent. Now, if that's not a definition of paramilitary, I don't know what is. And, and actually, if you look at uh, internal reporting, it's described as a paramilitary organization, uh, paramilitary um, force. I will look to David to, to discuss their comprehensive review of the, of the police that was done and published. And, and, and it's, you know, I think, we would say we were right on that. And I would say actually that the HMG is right. There's also public reporting uh, from earlier on of the police working in lockstep with the British military uh, in paramilitary ex exercise. And those those reports remain on the FCDO's website. So there you go. I mean, on, on that one, let's let's take that one. I think um the other the other points on the police, just just to pick that up. Oh, sorry, on the Taliban, just on the one point on the Taliban. Yes, you're absolutely right, of course. And I think. Putting it bluntly, um, it was not a palatable, it was not a palatable uh, thing to engage with the Taliban for our coalition colleagues, and primarily the U.S. military, and, and not necessarily the U.S. military, but the U.S. Po po politically back in Washington. Now that may be something that David may be able to comment on as well, but certainly I think everybody that we and we spoke to realised that there was there would be the need to engage with the Taliban. And indeed, probably elements of the UK government were and continue to engage with the Taliban, but I don't know that. Um, so the, the, the next thing just to just pick on is Mark, your point about Lotfa. Um how do we do pol policy? Uh, do, how do we do policing? As as Hugh said, just to reiterate, it's not that we're saying we shouldn't be supporting the police, but that according to the OECD DAC rules under which uh, aid is given. The rules are very clear that aid should only be given to the police if it is a civilian policing function. And that's the distinction that we've made. Who should do it and how that's done? Well, that, as, as Sir Hugh said, that, that's for others to sort out. But for us, our, our remit as ICAI is, is overseas develop, development assistance. What we have done, which uh, wasn't mentioned, is that um, Sir Hugh has met with uh, officials and, and the relevant minister and called for um, HMG to issue a clear uh, guidance and policy about how to provide this assistance to overcome the challenge that you make. Because we recognise there needs to be assistance to the police, but under the current OECD DAC guidance, you shouldn't be done to a parliamentary police, police force. 
Well, the, the pool funds are blended, of course. As you say, a pool fund for everybody is, is, is where there are some funds which are identified as odour and, and not. That still means then that there is still odour going to support the, the, the police in, in contravention of the, of, of the OECD guidance if those police are indeed paramilitary. I think it is a sticky issue. We've asked the government to put forward new guidance to overcome it. It will be interesting when ICAI does its follow-up, as it always does of reports. Every year we go back a year later and find out what has happened to see whether that guidance has been put in place. And I think that's that's where we're looking to on that. Um, shall I stop there and then, yeah, uh, David or Wesley? I'll move on to maybe your questions about the future of aid. Um, and maybe, I don't know if I can really answer this question about um, investments um, for British um, companies, but I'll, I'll have a go at that. Um, so in terms of aid, yes, it is difficult because the the different edicts that have been imposed by the Taliban have different implications at the provincial level. And different NGOs we've, uh, we've talked to have said it's very much a case-by-case -case basis when they try to get authorization and access. Um, but that also means that the Taliban have, a, unfortunately, a say in deciding who benefits from, from the aid. So making sure that not a single ethnicity benefits from it is one of the challenges that the NGOs we've spoken to um, have mentioned. Um, the aid must aid delivery must continue, um, but it has to be predicated of those fundamentals that um, human rights have upheld um, and that the Taliban um, respect those engagements that they've made in 2020, which is a different issue. And obviously, they are at the moment seem to be they seem to be violating all three main aspects of it. Um, but we can't disengage and something also that we need to think about is that if we disengage now but decide to return to the country at a later stage then all those ties you've built over the years over the past 20 years might disappear and it's going to be extremely difficult to rebuild them so that's something to really take into consideration when uh, talking about engagement or disengagement from afghanistan um, in terms of um, investment, um, I think it very much depends on whether we stick to humanitarian aid or want to uh, focus on development aid as well um, for all those NGOs to support the population, um, yes, aid, money is needed, but the infrastructure is not there. So do we want to start developing infrastructure in Afghanistan, but does that equal to um, recognizing the government? Uh, that's another question that needs to be addressed. Um, but there would be opportunities to do that if we decided to go down that path. But that also means that the security situation has to improve for investors to be able to move to Afghanistan. Um, I'll uh, touch on the uh, why we didn't negotiate with the Taliban. I'll try this. I'll, uh, I'll focus on why uh, we didn't negotiate with the Taliban. I can't speak to the British experience, but for the U.S., um, the uh, early on in the war, there was a sense of inevitability of our progress and our achievements, and there was a sense that we didn't need to negotiate with them. We could just simply bulldoze the Taliban and make sure and secure what we wanted off the battlefield. There was a great deal of uh, resentment and frustration, a great deal of emotional charge uh, as to why we wouldn't negotiate with the Taliban, because they had uh, har provided safe haven to uh, Al Qaeda, which attacked us on 9-11. And so there was um, going against all extensive evidence base around the world that uh, peaceful settlements to violent conflicts require inclusive settlements. Um, we sort of we uh, this is among the most among the in my opinion the biggest mistakes that we made during the twenty years of war is not including the Taliban at the bond uh, at bond in, in two thousand four if not earlier. Um, incidentally, one of the um, uh, cultural challenges certainly that the U.S. military had, but also U.S. US various U.S. administrations had, was this idea that we can't negotiate from a position of weakness. So we have to make battlefield gains so that we can then negotiate from a position of strength. The ironic thing is that when we were um, negotiating from a position of strength, our logic was, we don't need to negotiate, we've got them on the run. And so therefore, to many, uh, especially those who were filled with this understandable vitriol, there's no good time to negotiate. And this logic pervades a lot of peacebuilding challenges around the world. I think 
the U.S. and U.S. officials uh, were succumbed to this especially hard. Thank you. Um, excellent uh, round of questions. I'm really sorry to those of you who still have questions remaining and particularly those online, um, but I'd like you to join me in thanking our panelists and thank you all for today and for attending this in extremely interesting discussion.